And the last thing I want to leave you with is this. Never lose your focus. Never lose your focus. You know, you can get cute with it, and I've had people say to me, well, you know, when you wrote the book, you should have, I, no, no, I'm not going to get cute and say you're going to have potholes and you're going to take detours. I just came right out and said, don't lose your focus. You have to decide what's important and never take it for granted. You have to decide what's important and never take it for granted. And see, when you don't lose your focus, the ride is so much nicer, so much nicer. When I challenged you earlier to think about five people that made the biggest difference in your life, I will never forget speaking to a company right here in Orlando. 600 leaders, 14,000 employees were back home. I was addressing the 600 leaders and I said, I want you to think about five people who made the biggest difference in your life. And by the end of it, I was looking at 600 leaders and I said, now if I were to go back and speak to the 14,000 people that make up your company, the people that you lead, the people that you manage, the people that you motivate, let me ask you a question. If I ask those 14,000 people to make a list of five people who made the biggest difference in their life, how many of you would be on their list? You see, I tell people, don't lose your focus of what it is that we do. Don't lose your focus of what's important. Why? Because purpose is what drives you, passion is what fuels you, and pride defines you. Always has and always will. Remember to stay focused. And when somebody says you can't, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. I had the privilege of standing at a gate. And I, I'll never forget what unfolded that day I didn't think was going to become a story. I didn't think it would be part of a book. But that day a captain came off the plane. Now, I don't think United Airlines had a conference like this. I don't think United Airlines had speakers that came. I don't know. Maybe they do. I, I just, I'm, I'm guessing they don't. But all of a sudden, as Colin suggested... A pilot was about to make my flight go from good to great and make my view and perception of what one, pe one person can do who really understands how to enjoy the ride and stay focused. Here come the captain off the plane. It's, 10 minutes, it's about 15 minutes prior to boarding. And as you know, when you fly a lot, that's not good. That's just not good. But he came off the plane, and here's what he said. He said, ladies and gentlemen, he said, if I can get your attention here, those of you that gate C-12, and boy, he got our attention because when the captain is speaking and you're 15 minutes prior to boarding, you're like, here we go. Engine's not, we're not going. He said, everything is okay with the plane. But he said, here's what I'd like to do. He said, I'd like to share something with you. When I was seven years old, I built my first model airplane. He said, it was my dream to be a pilot. He says, today I'm living that dream. He said, I want to make you a promise. This is going to be the best flight you've ever flown. He said, I will do everything in my power to do that. Now, we've done our pre-flight checks, all of our safety checks. I've briefed the crew, and just so you know, the four beautiful flight attendants and the first officers named Ken, who lives in Schaumburg, Illinois, they're ready to greet you, and they're ready to also make this your best flight ever. A couple of things we need to go over. We'll be at 37,000 feet. He told us the nautical airspeed. He gave all the statistics, and he said, now, for those of you who don't like stats, let's move on to something else. Frankie, please stand up. A little boy stood up, and I, re I was standing here, and this little boy stood up over there. He said, this is Frankie. He represents one of 82,000 unaccompanied minors that fly every year. He said, Frankie will be in seat 6A. This is Frankie's mom. Frankie's mom is sending him to see Grandma in Sacramento for a week, summer vacation. If you're in row 6 or row 7 or any close to, to Frankie, please do me a favor. Make him feel welcome. Now I'd like to talk to the 10% of you, according to statistics, that have never flown before. No. I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to the 90% of you that do fly. There are 10% of the people in this gate area, which represents about 15 people. I'd like you to do me a favor. You'll find 15 people that don't know where to put their bag. You'll find 15 people that weren't prepared to get on it or digging for their glasses and they're holding up the aisle. There are 15 people that represent your grandmother, your grandfather, your favorite uncle. They represent your wife. They represent your daughter. They represent somebody. He said, please, be kind, help them, ask them, do you need, just know that we live in a great country that was built on great, great people. Be those great people today. He said, I love what I do. And he said, help me do it. He said, now, before I get on the plane, and he pointed to a row that I was standing in, he said, for all of you, and of course, I was standing on the red carpet where all the flyers, you know, were all over there the plutonium, you know, platinum, bronze. 
He said, and for all of you, he said, I've stood here and I realize, he said, there's probably 12 of you in that line. You fly 100,000. He said, 1.2 million miles you'll fly this year. Thank you so much. My wife and my three girls appreciate your loyalty to our brand because your loyalty to our brand allows me to continue doing what I'm doing. You could have heard a pin drop. I turned around and I saw another 100 people standing outside that weren't on our flight leg. Meanwhile, he said, now remember, be kind. Don't shove, don't push. And hey, today, why not let somebody else board ahead of you? I'll never forget when that woman at C-12 from United said, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and start the boarding, the pre-boarding. We'd like all of our plutonium, platinum passengers to come on now. I, I watched a group of guys, me included, going, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go, 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 go. Seriously, go ahead of me. Then I heard her say, all right, we'll try something else. Would somebody please get on the plane? <laughs> Man, we're all being friendly, just like, hey, hi, Dad, go, go ahead, go ahead. I sit down on a plane. Gospel. Guy named Mark sitting beside me. He introduces himself. He said, hey, I'm Mark. I said, hey, I'm Steve. That doesn't happen all the time either. He said, man, was that wild? I said, that is wild. Flight attendant smiled. She said, how you doing? She said, something to drink. I said, scotch. She said, all right, 8.30 in the morning, but we'll go with scotch. Well, I was so excited. I was in the moment. Come on, give me a break here. Maybe I shouldn't have had four more, but I was in the moment. Well, anyways, I'm talking to Mark, and all of a sudden I hear, ladies and gentlemen, this is your Captain Denny Flanagan in the cockpit. You should have heard. People go, shh. He said, if you're traveling with a black Labrador retriever, please ring your call button. All of a sudden, I heard, bing. He came out of the cockpit, walked past us, came back into the cockpit about five minutes later. That was it. The short version is this. I walked down through the terminal after I got off the flight as Denny Flanagan stood there shaking everybody's hand saying, thanks for flying with us. I walked down through the terminal and a total stranger named Mark who I'd only met on the flight stopped me like this. He goes, hey, hey, he says, I got to ask you a question. He said, based on what you do for a living, because we were talking about what we do, and he said, have you ever encountered anything like this? I said, no, sir. He said, here's another thing I want to let you know. Isn't it amazing how one person can define the entire culture of a situation. I said, that's amazing. 184 passengers, four flight attendants. And I said, I have never, he said, that was my next question. He said, have you ever had a better flight? I said, never in the continental US have I had a better flight. Two years later, I'm in Chicago. A guy walks up to me, said, would you sign my book? I went to sign his book and I looked up and I said, you look familiar. And he said, have you ever flown United Airlines? I'm like, yeah. I said, who do I make the book out to? He said, make it out to Captain Denny. I'm like, wait a minute, I said. I was on one of your flights. I said, I still remember it. I said, I can tell you where I was sitting. We were going to Sacramento. He said, was it the best flight you've ever flown? <laughs> I said, it was. <laughs> and then I finally said to him, I said, do you have a couple of minutes? And we, we stood there talking. Here's what I wanted to know. The Frankie thing that blew me away. You addressing all of us. He said, the Frankie thing shouldn't blow you away. But he said, here's what people don't do. They settle with being good. We've got a lot of good pilots. But I tell them, you want to be great, you want to take it to another level, when you land that airplane with a, non, with a child, a non-accompanied minor, when you land that plane, you have your first officer ferry that flight into the gate. You have the mom's cell phone number and the grandmother on the other end. You call mom first and you say to her, we've landed, we're not to the gate yet, but I wanted to let you know your son is safe. Then you call grandma and you tell grandma, if you'll look six rows back as we're coming into the gate, your grandson's face is probably pressed to the window to see you. He said it takes two minutes. Two minutes. And what does that do? He said it makes such a big difference in those people's lives. I said, what about the dog? He goes, oh, he said, I, I love animals. He said, I have two labs. I said, that is so cool. He says, so I go down in the, the ground crew. I'll say to them, anybody traveling underneath? And he said, for those people, I always reassure them, you know, hey, those dogs traveling underneath are in a crate. Matter of fact, they got more leg room and don't have to battle from the armrest. They are in good shape. <laughs> he said, I usually scratch it behind the ears, scratch them under the neck. He said, then I take out my phone and take a picture of them. When they ring their call button, I go back and say, is this your black Labrador retriever? 
You only have to look at the emotion, the smile in their eyes. And you look at him and say, better seat than you've got. <laughs> Doing fine. He said it only takes that much. You see what ends up happening in our lifetime? We don't enjoy the ride. Why? Because we're not daily conscious of something that I've said, and that is you've got to make a difference. You can't lose your focus. Yeah, you can have all the passion in the world, and you can live those moments, but don't lose your focus. I'll end with a story. I love when I speak to audiences that the old saying is Dr. Phil McGraw used to say, either you get it or you don't. Well, I always know where I end up and how I end up there. Between agents and people that will book me, I always know how I ended up at a certain event. In 1999, I finished speaking in Savannah, Georgia. It was one of my first ever engagements. I was nervous and I was scared and I wondered how well I had done. And I was with a pretty good star lineup. Well, all of a sudden, here comes a guy walking out with no neck, khaki pants. This guy was big. Didn't have a lanyard and a name badge. And I didn't even think he was at the event. But he walked up to me and said, and I quote, I need you, and I need you bad. I said, you are? He said, I own a construction company. He said, I want you to speak at my annual employee meeting. I said, I'd be honored. I said, when, when's your meeting? He said, July. I looked at him, and I'll never forget when I said, well, wait a minute. I said, July. I said, that's only a few weeks away. I said, I'm probably already booked. He said, I'll pay anything. I said, it's your lucky day. <laughs> he said, aren't you going to check your schedule? I said, funny how that date just seems to be open. He said, that's what I like about you. You're funny. He said, I hired a speaker last year, Armani, Gucci, Rolex, perfect hair, perfect kids, perfect wife. He was perfect. He said, my guys hated him. He said, they're going to like you. I said, how do you know they'll like me? You screwed up half your life. My men can relate to you. I said, you keep saying you're men. He said, I own a construction company. He said, that meeting will be attended by 99% male. I said, wow. I said, okay. I said, uh, let's do this. You take a business card of mine. You give us a call. He walked off. And let me tell you something else. You want to be great? Listen, labeling is disabling. You have no idea who you're sitting beside, who you're talking to. You take that one to the bank, literally. And Mo Money will tell you that one. Be very careful not to label people. Because when you label people, mm, not good. I went golfing one time by myself, so I thought I was going by myself. And you ever have that moment you just want a time to yourself? And I had got my driver out, and all of a sudden I heard, hey, 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 hey. I'm like, mm -hmm. here come this old man down there like this. He said, you mind if I hit along? <laughs> Meanwhile, I just wanted to get a quick round in. I had a flight to catch that afternoon. He said, I'll be, I, he pulled out, he's got a, Pulling them. I go, put your clubs in mine. No, I'm not. He said, good night, he said. You guys in them carts, he said. You end up being fat. I look at his golf bag. He had four golf clubs. He had a driver, a putter, and two irons. I said, where's your clubs? He said, it's all I need. I teed off. I'm way over to the right. He pulls out a three iron. 175 down the middle. He said, I'll see you at the green. <laughs> By the fifth hole, his phone rang. You'll love this one. Old guy digging for his phone. He doesn't even know how to answer the phone. I said, flip it open. <laughs> He's going like it. I said, flip it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, cutie pie. Yeah, 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 cutie pie. He said, yeah. How about Friday night? Yeah, 7 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, we'll go eat first, and then we'll go for groceries. Never good to go for groceries before you eat. You never want to be hungry. You buy too much. Yeah, yeah. I'll see you Friday night. This guy's old, right? We get up to the seventh hole. His phone rang again. Hello. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 sugar. Friday is not a good night. <laughs> I walked up to this guy. I said, how old are you? I'm 82. I said, you got more action at 82 than I got in being single for 14 years in two holes of golf. I said, what's your secret? 
He kind of grinned. He said, I'll tell you the secret, man. He said, that's why you should get your hiney out of that cart. He said, keep yourself looking good like me. He said, because when you become 82 and you still have your driver's license permitted to drive at night, you are one popular male. <laughs> Don't label somebody. So I label this guy. He walks off. I, I actually called the office. He said, how was the event? I said, it was great. I had one person working for me at the time. Her name was Marcia. I said, it was a great event. She said, good, good, good. She said, we get any leads. I said, well, I said, we had one guy at the end. I said, he looked like he got a construction company, about seven people, pickup truck and a few shovels. He's got one of my cards. You know, maybe I'll get down there and talk to seven people. Two days later, she called me and she said, you remember that seven people you're going to talk to? That guy faxed back a contract. He put a corporate American Express card to pay your fee. Said you could, ready? Said you could spend up to $2,000 for your airfare. This is 1999. I said, $2,000 for my airfare? I said, you can't spend $2,000 flying from Pittsburgh to Chattanooga round trip. And I'm going to tell you how I know. I tried. <laughs> I even told the girl at US Airways, just give me the whole row. Just give me the whole row. I'll just buy the whole. They're buying it. Give me the whole row. I didn't do that. Some of you are like, boy, hey, boy, he's not real. Stay with me. Humor. Well, anyways, I was, I was getting all ready and I was geared up to get on there. And I said, Marsha, you're going to come with me. She said, why? I said, I just got off the conference call. She goes, what's, what's that mean? I go, well, here's all he said on the conference call. When I said, what do I need to know about the audience? He said, here's all you need to know. Predominantly men. They hate meetings. They don't like speakers. <laughs> and he said, there's one more thing. They're having it on a Saturday, and it's going to really tick them off. <laughs> I said, you're going with me. She said, what am I going to do? I said, you're going to protect me. There's going to be 500 negative, angry men sitting in a ballroom on their day off. They're not going to be happy. You're going to cheer them up that morning. That morning came around. We didn't have banquet-style seating like this. We had classroom-style seating. And Mr. Genius here decided, make big tent cards. That way I can interact with you and get to know your name. I said to Marsha, I said, get their names real big. Whatever you do, get their names real big. Finally, after 20 minutes, she said, I know how to write a person's name. She said, here, I'll, I'll tell you. She, I'll show you. Bill, B-I-L-L. -L. She said, I got it. Get upstairs. You're nervous. I said, I'm scared to death. She said, come back down when you're all relaxed. I'll take care of the name thing. I come back down 30 minutes later. First thing this guy said to me? No. First thing Marsha said to me was, I don't think they're using their real names. <laughs> I said, how do you know that? She said, so far there's five here. Fred, Wilma, Bam, Bam, Dino, and Barney. I said, what'd you write the Flintstones for? She said, when a guy six foot seven, 295 pounds, wearing boots and jeans, and a cowboy hat says he's Wilma, he's Wilma. <laughs> and then the guy, the guy that hired me, walked up to me and he said, you ready? I said, Joe, I'm a nervous wreck. He said, come here. He took me down the lobby of a hotel. I remember it like it was yesterday. He sat me down. He said, I like you. He said, man, you're real. He said, these guys are going to like you. He said, don't be nervous. He said, they put their pants on the same way you do. Yeah. I said, I'm nervous. He said, listen, when I heard you speak in Savannah, you talked about a lot of things, but one word popped out, and that was passion. Another was focus. He said, I lost a $200 million contract three days before I heard you. I wasn't even going to go to that conference. I sat at a dinner, my wife with one of my clients and his wife. And when I looked and said, why? He said, I like you. Personally, I like you. But he said, professionally, you guys have lost your focus. You take too much for granted. And you've taken us for granted. He said, I'm going to bid it out. He said, I walked out of that restaurant that night. He said, oh, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. But he said it was a kick in the pants I needed to realize we had lost our passion and we had lost our focus. And to use your words, we weren't enjoying the ride. He said, I want you to stir it up, man. And he said, by the way, we're not starting till Brian gets here. I said, who's Brian? He said, all my foremen, project managers, they report to him. Good boy. But he said, he influences a lot of people. And he said, right now, he's lost his focus and his passion. He said, and by the way, don't let him intimidate you. 
I said, why would he, he said, well, he's a big boy. All of a sudden, I was standing there talking to Marsha, and all of a sudden, here come a guy down through, and I went, Marsha, why do I know this is Brian? Six foot six, six foot six, maybe six, seven. All I know, he's got a pair of Tony Lamas ostrich cowboy boots. He had a pair of real tight blue jeans and a belt buckle the size of a Dell laptop computer. <laughs> First thing I saw at 40 yards were pecs. The boy's coming down with a cowboy hat on. He's got a styrofoam cup, and I'm thinking, where'd he get coffee? He wasn't drinking coffee. He was making deposits. <laughs> Owner looked at me, and I looked at Brian. He said, Brian, it's our speaker. His exact words were, Pfft. and he walked in. <laughs> then I get introduced. You'll love this one. The owner of the company stands up. No, I didn't have more money or even Chip to introduce me. Here's what I got. All right, fellas, knock it off. <laughs> and I'm in the back of the room waiting to come up, right? He said, I know it's your day off, and I know you don't want to be here. I'm like, that's it. Remind them. <laughs> he said, but there's one piece of house cleaning. Don't you dare do to this year's speaker what you did that guy last year. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm like, what in the world did they do to this poor guy? Me when I'm all wound up. I know some of you find that hard to believe. I got all wound up by lunchtime. I'm up there thinking, oh. I called back to the office and I said, man, I said, oh, I am into this. And I told her about Brian. I, you know, I, I was just, I was just one, like one of those things like, oh. And back then, the only person in the office was my mom. Marcia was with me. Well, anyways, I said to my mom, I said, it's going good, it's going good. She said, all right. She said, keep the faith. I go, don't bring religion in this, mom. Don't start that stuff right now. Don't ever say that to your mother. Don't bring religion in. Whoa, that was a whole other conversation. Anyways, I'm in the room by myself, and all of a sudden a guy walked in. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. If at that moment you're like, why, why, why? It's Brian. I'm the only one in the room. He's walking towards me. I'm acting like I don't see him. <laughs> he came up behind me, tapped me in the shoulder. Here's what he said. Speaker man. Now, I like that speaker man. You know Spider-Man, Batman, and Superman? Speaker man. He said, you got anything I can write with? I never thought he heard a word. I'll never forget what Margaret used to say to me. She said, you know the problem with some salespeople? I said, what's that? She said, they speak from here. She said, the good ones speak from here. And I'll never forget what Margaret said to me. What comes from the heart goes to the heart. She said, always speak from the heart. Maybe you'll hit the heart. Well, that morning, I didn't know what I had said that hit his heart, but I could tell he was a little bit different than when I first met him. I got to the end, and I thought, I'm going to give her a grand closing. I would called my son. And those that know me and my family know my past. When somebody will say to me, boy, it must be nice, I'm like, oh, you need to know what it's like to wake up in a two-bedroom apartment sleeping on an air mattress raising two kids. But I went to my son, and I said, I want to say something, but I don't want to be disrespectful of your mom. She said, he said, mom would actually probably cry if she heard that. I said, okay, I just checking. I never want to get you boys upset. I never knew when I was going to use it, and all of a sudden that day it just flew into my head, and I did. And here's what I said to a group of predominantly males. I said, how many of you guys are married? And hands went up everywhere. And Brian went like this. I was going to make a point I don't lose your focus, because when you do, the ride gets really, really bumpy. He went like this, and I said, how many years have you been married? He said, 19. I said, what's your wife's name? He said, Lisa. I said, do you have any children? He said, three boys. And I'm not too ashamed to admit, I fought back tears. I said, well, then don't do what I did. You see, at that moment in 1999, he had what I wanted, but I had realized you could have all the passion in the world. But if you're not living today for today and you're thinking about tomorrow and you lose focus, boy, I looked at him and said, I spent 11 years in the company. For nine years, I had an incredible career. For the last two, it became a job because I lost, my, I lost my passion. I said, but more importantly, at home, I used to wake up in the morning, there was a craft of coffee. I used to go out and pour the coffee in the cup, and the funny thing is, the creamer was already in there. I said I'd pour the coffee in the cup. Never questioned the coffee being there. Why? Well, I didn't expect it, and I know that she didn't feel obligated, but it was there every morning. I said, I never knew how much I appreciated that, and I never knew how much 
That meant to me until the morning that it wasn't there. I said for weeks I would go to McDonald's and I couldn't even put the little creamers in the coffee because it reminded me of that one thing, just one thing I had taken for granted. I looked at him and you could hear a pin drop when I said, Brian, here's what I want you to do. I said, over the weekend, I said, I want you to think about what brought you to this company. I want you to think about this company. I want you to think about everything it does for you and what you do for it, but I want you to reach back to when you first came to this company. And I said, that fire you had in your belly, that excitement, I said, I want that to be back. I said, every company will have their challenges. But I said, you think about what it is you love about this company. I said, then when you go home tonight, and this is when I was full-blown tears, I said, you go home tonight. You find your wife of 19 years, and you give her a kiss in the cheek. And you tell her how much you love her. And then when you go to bed tonight, and for some reason that day I was standing down front and on one of the tables there was a, like a linen napkin. I picked it up and I said, tonight, smell the sheets. I said, I bet they're fresh and I bet they're clean and I got a hypothetical chance of getting this right. I said, I bet they're fresh and clean. And I bet I know how they got that way. I said, she comes to bed tonight. You kiss her on the cheek and tell her how much you appreciate the fact they're fresh and clean. You could heard a pin drop when I looked at him and said, you gonna do it? He looked up at me, and it was one of those defining moments. I thought, it's going to be good. Oh, it was even better than good. It was, he looked at me and said, you're bizarre. <laughs> I said, bizarre or not, it's going to work. Well, I left, and they gave me a standing go, and they were cheering, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness gracious, this is wonderful. Man, I was pumped up. Marsh and I are in the lobby, and I, I, it's like I was a little kid. I didn't want to go. I said, let's just hang around a little bit. Well, I shouldn't have said that because all of a sudden I heard, Speaker Man! Jeez! Marshall looks at me and goes, I'll wait in the car. <laughs> he walked up, he said, Speaker Man. He said, thanks. I said, you're welcome. He said, number one, I apologize for my remark at the end. He said, I tend to be a little macho, but when you got four brothers and three boys of your own, <laughs> he said, there's kind of a protocol within our family. He said, there was no call for me to say that because he said, you're not bizarre. He said, as a matter of fact, you're the, probably the realest person I've met. But he said, I'm, I stopped you for this reason. For the last 10 months, all I have done is focus on what's wrong with this company. He said, but you know something? He said, no more. He said, I'm going to focus on what it is we do well. I'm going to focus. He said, life's going to throw you curveballs. He said, I used to step up to the plate and say, go ahead and throw me a curveball. Watch how far I hit it. Today you throw me a curveball and I complain about it. He said, that's not why I stopped you. He said, if I ever woke up and my wife Lisa wasn't laying beside me, as sure as I stand here, I'd tell God not to wake me up the next day. He said, thanks for the wake-up call. I said, you're welcome. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'll tell you what, come Monday, I'm going back in there. I'm going to get it all fired up. He said, it's back, man. He said, fire in the belly, right? He said, tonight, I'm going to find that little woman. I'm going to lay one on her and say, I love you. I said, you may want to practice that on the way home. I said, what about the sheets and pillowcases? He said, I'm not doing no linen sniffing this weekend. July 20th, 1999, there's a letter. I've got a background in sports. I've got a chance, as I said last night, to a couple of people to meet some very, very, very interesting and neat people in the world of sports. But if you come to my office, you won't find any memorabilia. I reserve that for my game room. But in my office hangs a letter, which has defined my company and have defined me as a speaker for years. The author of the letter is Brian. When I got the letter, I cried. I couldn't believe it. He said, thanks to you. And he went through all these things and gave me so many compliments, but he said, I had lost my focus. I lost my passion. He went through this whole thing, and by the end, as I was crying, he put, P.S. I even did the sheet thing. He had his phone number there and a work number and a page, and I was all excited, and I thought, man. And so at the urging of my mother, I said, you need to call him. I'm like, Mom, you don't call back people that have been in the audience. I said, Mom, you don't understand. She said, call him. 
I'm like, all right, I'll call him. Three weeks from the day I'd spoke down there, I picked up the phone and his home number I called. He said, yeah. I said, this is Steve Gilliland. He said, who? I said, the speaker from Chattanooga, to which he said, he said, do you have any more of those tips? I said, tips. He said, I like stuffed pork chops, white gravy, green beans, mashed potatoes, coleslaw, buttered carrots, and homemade biscuits. In 19 years of marriage, I've had my favorite breakfast food, my favorite dinner food, fixed in the same day only three times. Since you've spoke, I got it again. <laughs> Wait to hear this said, she even gave me a massage. I said, what happened? He said, she was standing by the kitchen sink. And he said, all of a sudden, he said, I got home and she was there and I mustered the courage. Because I don't say I love you for no reason. It wasn't like it was a holiday or a birthday or something. <sighs> so I walked over to her and I laid one on her cheek. No, he said, I tried, but she turned too quick and I kissed her in the eyelid. <laughs> he said, I kissed her in the eyelid and said, I love you. And she looked at me and I'll never forget what she said. I said, was it like a defining moment? Oh, yeah. She looked at me and said, you've been drinking. <laughs> he said, I went to bed that night. I had no plan on doing that sheet thing. But all of a sudden, she come to bed. She pulled the bed spread up too high and she had the sheets on my face. And he said, that's when it happened. I go, what happened? He goes, I could smell all the foo-foo she sprinkles on him. I go, I never heard the term. I go, the what? He said, you know, the foo-foo. She sprinkles on to make it smell good. I go, foo-foo. I go, let me put you in on the scoop on something. It's called downy. He said, whatever it was, I could smell it. And I had a little mini speaker man on my shoulder going, tell her, tell her, tell her, tell her, tell her, tell her. He said, I leaned over and I kissed her on the cheek. And I just, just thanked her for sheets. I thanked her for so many things in my life I had taken for granted. He said, I called, he said, I was going to call you, but I wrote you that letter because I was going by the laundry room. 6.30 that morning, after I had told her how much I loved her that night, told her how much I appreciated the sheet, I was going by the laundry room, 6.30 the next morning, and she was in the laundry room, putting sheets and pillowcases and all kind of stuff. In it. And I looked at her, and I said, Lisa, what's wrong? She turned smiling. She said, these are happy tears. She said, for 19 years of our marriage, I've done this laundry because I thought I had to. She said, today's the first day I've done it because I want to. I've told leaders all over the world. I've told people all over the world, if you want to know when you've arrived as a leader, it's when they follow you because they want to, not because they believe they have to. If Margaret were here, she would say, it's not how you start out in life. It's not how you finish this life. The true joy of life always has been and always will be in the trip. But my final words or what Brian said that made me laugh, and I hope it leaves you with a smile on your face and one in your heart when he said, Speaker man, she then grabbed a big old blue jug of something, filled the cap with it, threw it in a washing machine, looked at me and winked and said, Big boy, you get a second cap full today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Old Dominion, and God bless. Thank you.